Hello, in this video, we're going to talk about the anatomy and the physiology of the salivary glands. We have three types of salivary glands bilaterally, all of which produce saliva. The salivary glands produce saliva, which is essentially uh, going to enter into the oral cavity, located around here where the tongue is. Now, sitting below the tongue, you have the two sublingual salivary glands. Under the mandible, your lower jaw, to the back of the mouth, you have the two submandibular salivary glands. And then you have the bilateral parotid glands, which is the largest salivary gland sitting sort of posterior to the master muscle and um, anterior to the sternocleidoid mastoid muscle. Each salivary gland um, have ducts which drain into the oral cavity, the mouth. The parotid duct here, the submandibular duct, and the sublingual ducts drain into the oral cavity. Here is the masseter muscle again, which sits anterior to the parotid gland. Saliva is produced and secreted into the mouth, producing a alkali substance. Interestingly, the submandibular gland produces the majority of the saliva, roughly 70%. Second is the parotid glands, which is about 25% of sal saliva production. Let's zoom into the structure of the salivary gland and look at how everything works. The functional unit of the salivary glands is called a salivon. A salivon consists of acinar cells, which produces this isotonic secretion. And this is the first part of saliva production. Surrounding these acinar cells are myoepithelium, which can contract, moving the fluid produced by the acinar cells towards the ducts. Here, along the ducts, the fluid flows, and these duct cells will reabsorb sodium chloride, but it will not reabsorb the water, making the saliva more hypotonic. The saliva has three main functions. Lubrication, protection, and there's a few ways. One way is that it contains lysosomes, which attack the bacterial cell walls. Lactoferrin, which chelates iron, and iron is normally needed by many bacteria for replication. And also, it can contain IgA, which is an immunoglobulin, and helps in the immune response. The final function is digestion, because saliva contains amylase and lingual lipase, which helps break down carbohydrates and fats, respectively. Some clinical anatomy, Schrogen's disease, is a systemic autoimmune disorder most commonly presenting with Sika symptoms. Sika refers to dryness, most often involving the eyes, mouth, ears, and even nose, all of which are due to inflammation and resultant pathology of the lacrimal and salivary glands. Schrogen's disease is a rheumatological disease and is associated with other rheumatological conditions including rheumatoid arthritis. Saliva is produced by the salivary glands, of which we have three pairs. So what stimulates saliva secretion? Well, salivation is uh, stimulated by thought, sight, smell, and taste. Sleep, dehydration, fatigue, and fear all inhibit salivation. The salivary gland have different uh, nerves which supply it. In the brainstem, you have the pons and medulla region, and here you can find the superior salivatory nucleus and the inferior salivatory nucleus. The part of the nervous system responsible for the rest and digest response, and so saliva production is the parasympathetic nervous system. The salivatory nucleus have parasympathetic neurons targeting the salivary glands via glossopharyngeal nerve and the fa facial nerve. Originating from 
the salivary nucleus in the pons, you have the facial nerve passing through the parotid gland and synapsing with a second neuron at the submandibular ganglion. This second neuron is what will supply the sublingual and submandibular gland, increasing parasympathetic tone, causing salivation. From the inferior salivatory nucleus, the parasympathetic tone is via the glossopharyngeal nerve, which synapses with a second neuron at the optic ganglion. From here, the nerve will stimulate parotid glands to produce saliva. When we think of parasympathetic nervous system, we need to think about acetylcholine. Let's see how these neurons stimulate the salivation process. On the acinus cells, you have receptors on the basal surface. These receptors are muscarinic receptors, three or even one. The parasympathetic tone of the salivary glands are controlled by cranial nerve nine and seven. And these guys will secrete acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds onto muscarinic receptors in the area, causing sodium and water to enter the lumen, producing isotonic fluid, which is the initial part of uh, the saliva production. Thus, by inhibiting muscarinic receptors or inhibiting this interaction between acetylcholine and the receptor, you can really cause dry mouth. So clinical pharmacology, looking at drugs and the dry mouth. So many drugs can cause a dry mouth. Remember, the parasympathetic neuron secretes acetylcholine, which binds onto muscarinic receptors on the basal surface of the acinar cells. This causes salivation. Anticholinergics are drugs that block the action of acetylcholine. Atropine is one example. Atropine works by mimicking acetylcholine, and thus it can bind onto this muscarinic receptor, preventing the actual acetylcholine to bind onto the receptor, thus causing a dry mouth. Diuretics is another drug that works indirectly to cause a dry mouth by causing an increase in fluid excretion, thus reducing fluid volume, which can lead to a dry mouth. Other medications that are important causes of dry mouth are antipsychotics, sympathomimetics, and cytotoxic drugs. The parotid gland is an important gland because many conditions can cause it to become inflamed, a term called parotitis. Also, parotid tumors can occur requiring what's called a parotidectomy, which is the removal of the parotid gland. Normally, parotidectomies come with no complications, but there are some rare complications, including what's called Bell's palsy. And this is caused by cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve injury during the operation. Injury to the facial nerve on the affected side causes weakness of the muscle of facial expression on that side. Remember, the cranial nerve seven or the facial nerve will passes through the parotid gland and anatomically, the parotid gland is divided into the deep and superficial lobes, which are separated by the facial nerve. Frey's syndrome is another interesting complication of parotidectomy, and this is caused by auriculotemporal nerve injury, which is a branch of cranial nerve number five, which is the trigeminal nerve. Injury to the auriculotemporal nerve will cause the affected side to have gustatory sweating, which is symptoms of profuse head and neck diaphoresis and flushing with eating. Here is an image of a patient that has facial nerve palsy or Bell's palsy on the right side. As you can see, when asked to smile, the right side of his face, the muscles are weak. Here's a photograph of a person that has had a left parotidectomy, as seen by the scar. When this person eats, he has gustatory sweating, where you have flushing as well as sweating on the affected side. And this is due to injury to the auriculotemporal nerve, a branch of the trigeminal nerve. This condition is called Frey's syndrome.